And welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, MMA Creative Vice President, Democratic Operative Mike Kopp, and her daily on 1510 WLAC, syndicated talk show host, Steve Gill. Welcome, gentlemen. Nice to see you again. Let's talk a little bit about the GOP presidential primary and the impact on Tennessee. Obviously, no candidates from Tennessee, but Rick Perry's been here, Michelle Bachman's been here, Scooter Clippert is working with Sarah Palin. A lot of Tennessee money is involved in this race, and some of the candidates are planning more trips here to see about more Tennessee money. Talk a little bit about that role, and do you think Tennessee's chosen a candidate yet? Well, you know, Mitt Romney was in Memphis yep. raising money. Uh, Herman Cain's going to be here in a couple of weeks, even after kind of this main fundraising push. He's going to be doing a statewide tour across Tennessee. I think for Tennessee, it's, it's both money and it's visibility, where you've got a good conservative red state, which means that whenever the primary ends up happening and you've got a lot of chaos in that right now, Tennessee is still going to be early enough in the process. And if these guys slog it through with Perry and Romney, right. maybe Kane, maybe Palin getting in, Tennessee could be a player this time. And it's been a long time since that's been the case. And Williamson County, one of the most highly donating counties in the state for presidential races, both Democrats and Republicans. Obviously, Republicans is, is the reason for yeah, Williamson I think, County's I, money. I think it's the money. I mean, clearly it's the money. I think it's way too early for, for these candidates to even be thinking about votes and, and even probably even worrying about endorsements, unless the endorsements open up the door for money. Um, but, but I think at the end of the day, it's all about the money. Democrats mind, we're 13 months. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You forget how close, and it's it's not close to, I think, the average citizen who right. isn't going to think about it till next October. Right. But it's 13 months away. And we were talking this week with Tony Blankley, who was Newt Gingrich's former top advisor. Barack Obama's problem is that right now the president is chasing down his black base. He's chasing down the Hispanic base, the young voter base. He's working his base 13 months before the election when he ought to be full on the independents. So it's early to some extent, and, and you're going to see people solidifying on the Republican side. But Barack Obama is having to chase his base when he ought to be locked in. Democrats will never say this, but does the president basically write Tennessee off? Does it make sense for him to spend money here? I mean, basically, when he ran the last time, he came here once before he was announced candidate and talked to Phil Bredesen. I think he's been to Memphis one time, but really, he doesn't do much in Tennessee. He's not going to get much support here. He obviously didn't win this. Well, well, I think he's not going to get much support here. I think that's, I think that's fair. And I think also, you, right now, you're chasing the big electoral states. I mean, he's focusing a lot of time in Colorado. He's focusing a lot of time in California. I mean, you, the, he's got to go to some states, particularly those swing states like Colorado and some in the Midwest, that actually put him over the top last time. He's got to spend time there. I wouldn't say Tennessee's a complete goner, but at this point, he doesn't need to be focusing any time. And could Tennessee problem. play that spoiler role? Could Tennessee be like it was in 2000 if the Democrats don't carry it? It could be the one of the states that decides this election. It's going to be close, whether people believe it or not. Things are going to have to shift pretty dramatically in the electoral front. I mean, and, and Barack Obama's problem right now is that he's in trouble in places like Florida and Virginia and Michigan and Ohio Big and Pennsylvania states, right. and Nevada, right. places that are the swing states right. that, that carried him last time, and he's below water in most of those at this point and when you start narrowing the race where yeah, you can win california and new york but beyond that you've got to win those swing states and he's in trouble in those states anything democrats can do to change some of the landscape here no, I, I, you know it, it's gonna it the best thing they could do is focus on you know all politics are local so the best thing they could do is try to find the best group, group of candidates that they could try to run locally the problem is the republicans are in charge of redistricting so even right now democrats aren't sure what these districts are going to look like there are some incumbent Democrats that I know in the legislature are worried about, you know, losing their, their seats right. because of the redistricting. So right now it's probably this election cycle is going to be a little bit of kind of hold on to what you got and maybe try to start farming, creating a farm team of candidates that you can roll out over the next four to six years. Here's what has Republicans <laughs> terrified right now, and I've been talking to a lot of folks around the country. What if Barack Obama, seeing his low poll numbers, seeing the problem state by state, seeing Democrats in states like Virginia run away from him, what if he decides in about January not to seek re-election and the Democrats hand the torch to Hillary Clinton, suddenly the whole political dynamic shifts, suddenly in both Senate races, U.S. House races, in the presidential race, it's a whole new ball game. And I got to tell you, Dick Morris this week is saying he has heard from Democrat strategists that it is very possible. Interesting scenario. I hadn't seen that since 68 when Lyndon Johnson decided not to run for re-election. President Obama is in this game 100 percent. I've heard the same theories. I think a lot of that's wishful thinking on, on certain folks' part. Ba Clinton's Obama's part. In <laughs> Clinton's part. Well, even Clinton has said that she's not interested in running. I think that's sincere. Uh, I think Obama's in this race, and, and I, I, that's going to be the I, I have said that I think he's going to put super glue on his hands when he loses and stick it to the wall <laughs> and drag him and the wall from the White House. Let's talk a little bit about Tennessee. We heard Governor Haslam talking about Tennessee being job readiness, being ready for jobs. We do know this since Governor Alexander. Every governor has talked about ways to improve jobs, to attract jobs. Governor, Has governor Haslam is doing it now. Governor Bredesen did it. Governor McWhorter did it. 
Is that one of the common denominators both Republicans and Democrats can support together of improving Tennessee's ability to create jobs and, and bring in new jobs? I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think the problem is we've got plenty of Tennesseans who are ready for jobs, but there's plenty of people in Nevada, North Carolina, yep. you know, the entire country that are ready for jobs. We've got to get the job creation happening. And in Tennessee, a lot of their focus now is, is not only trying to attract jobs from other places and bring them here, and it is fertile ground to do that, particularly if states like Illinois doing everything they can to help us, but you've also <laughs> got to grow with what you've got. And we haven't really focused a lot of attention because it is so hard to measure. If a three-person company grows to four, you can't really measure that very well, and that's why it hadn't gotten a lot of attention in the past. The problem that Republicans have on the national level and on the local level in Tennessee is that their whole mantra is, when it comes to jobs creation, is let's create a better environment. The fact is, in Tennessee, we've got the perfect environment for Governor jobs. Governor Haslam says so. The problem is, we don't have the jobs. We don't have the companies willing to put the money out there. A lot of it comes back to access to capital. It gets back into the whole banking system. Banks holding on to the money, which is a lot of, outside of the control of a lot of political figures. But again, the problem Republicans are going to have as they're going into this election, you got Rick Perry saying his job growth strategy is to is to create more incentives for uh, to create a better business climate. We've got the climate; we just don't have the investments. And we talked, you know, during the last election cycle, that Republicans were making a mistake to go too far out mm -hmm. on a limb of we're going to create jobs because Tennessee doesn't act in a bubble. You can't create a huge birth dearth of jobs in this in this state while the national economy is hurting so bad you look at the states that really are growing jobs right now that have three four percent unemployment rates it's north dakota it's texas it's places that have oil fueling a lot of their right. job growth and we just unfortunately don't have a lot of oil. And Governor Haslam has kind of moved the direction a little bit as opposed to attracting big companies, Hemlock, VW, those kind of companies, to grow jobs from companies that are existing here. And the problem with that, like you mentioned, is companies have cash on hand, but they're holding tight to it. And if they don't spend that cash, you're not going to be hiring any more employees. What's going to happen is when we get close to the election, voters are going to, are going to wake up and look at which party has done more to create jobs. And they're going to look at the Republican Party and say, a lot of good talk, no new jobs. Same problem the administration has on the, on the Democratic side. A lot of good talk, no, no new, new jobs. jobs. I don't think, though, that the voters are going to blame a, a Tennessee Republican Party, a Tennessee Ooh. Republican governor, when the national economy is clearly what has gone to, to hell in a handbasket. And I don't think they're going to say this is the Bill Haslam economy in Tennessee. I think it's going to be the Barack Obama economy. The problem is that unless, but right now, the national Republicans that are running for president, Rick Perry in, in particular, are saying the same thing that, that Haslam's saying, and it's <laughs> not going to create any new jobs. We saw in the poll numbers on one of our graphics, 60% of people polled support the death penalty. Here in Tennessee, Gail Owens is going to be freed. She was convicted of hiring a hitman to kill her husband. She admitted doing it. She was abused, she says, beaten by this person. Governor Bredesen commuted it to life in prison. Now she's going to be released. Complicated case. Does this really address the death penalty issue, or is this one of those individual cases you've got to take on a one-by-one -one basis? I think you always take them on a one-by-one on -one basis. You've had, uh, in just the last few weeks, uh, executions in Texas of, of the man who drugged James Byrd to his death behind a pickup truck. Not a lot of sympathy out there, not a lot of candlelight right. vigils or people demanding you know, a different kind of justice there. On the other hand, you had a cop killer that was executed, I think it was in Georgia, and again, you had national celebrities weighing in on that. I don't see a lot of distinction in those two cases, but each case, I think you have to judge by itself. You have to judge by, by the, the merits of the case and how it was tried, and that's what governors end up doing, and that's what these parole groups end up doing. Talk a little bit about, as we close out this segment, the discussion going on in Westmoreland regarding prayer in school. Two coaches bowed their heads as students after a football game prayed. They school self-reported, saying this is a possible violation. Yeah, they didn't report to the NCAA where they might have gotten the death penalty, fortunately. Instead, they were trying to avoid complications in a right. lawsuit. We have to understand there's a difference in a teacher reading the Bible over the loudspeaker in school, which is prohibited, and teachers who are allowed to have their faith. And if they are praying or bowing their heads and showing respect for faith on school grounds but on their time, that to me is not what our founding fathers My wanted to My advice to Smyrna, the Sumner County school officials is they should have used some common sense. This is one of those things. They're throwing gasoline on a fire. It's dangerous. Mike Cobb, Steve Gill, appreciate your time and your insights. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.